Do you believe the shroud of Turin buried cloth of Jesus? What is, we'll try to go in order, how about that? What is the rapture? Now, if you would, open up your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. If I, let me just make sure I'm correct on that. 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, yeah, let's, let's start, start in verse... 13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Okay, I'm going to start the paragraph mark right there. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now, asleep in this context is dead. So you got to make sure you, you understand when... There is mentioning of sleeping in the Bible where somebody's actually asleep in a bed or you know, sleeping. And then there's a sleep concerning death. And you guys got to make those distinctions depending on the context. Okay? So, concerning them which are asleep that ye sorrow not. Now, why would you sorrow if you were asleep unless somebody's dead? See, that's the context. Even as others which have no hope. Now, why would I go to bed and go to sleep and then I have no hope? Unless it's death, right? That's, see, that's what I mean by context. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus. See that? Sleeping, it's not going to bed at night and you're sleeping under the banner of thinking you're in Jesus. No, it is actual death. They're sleeping in Jesus. Will God bring with him? So there's a bringing of those that sleep in Jesus. There's going to come a time. Now let's keep reading. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now, the coming of the Lord. Now, there, there, you got two categories of people. You got people that only believe in the second coming of Christ. You say, well, preacher, do you believe in the second coming of Christ? Absolutely. But I don't believe only in the second coming of Christ. I believe that there is a coming of the Lord in the clouds for the church, not for every human being, for the church, for those that have trusted and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day, those that have trusted that and believed on that are placed in the body of Christ, which we call the church. And we are no, also known, a.k.a., as the bride of Christ. We are not the wife of God. We're the bride of Christ. God has a wife. His wife is an adulterous wife called the nation of Israel. We are not the nation of Israel. We are a chaste virgin. Okay, according to Peter. Okay, so let's keep going. For if we believe that, this verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ. Not all the dead. What kind of dead? The dead in Christ. If you ain't in Christ, that's not dealing with you. Are you in Christ? That's dealing with you. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain. So we're alive, right? Are we not alive right now? We're alive. Are we in Christ? If you're saved, you're in Christ. If you're not saved, this is not dealing with you. Okay, so 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Who's the them? That's the dead in Christ. So everybody that's died in the past all the way from the first advent that have trusted the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all those that died, they're in Christ, even though they're in the ground. They're absent from the body. They're present with the Lord. Their soul is present with the Lord. And they're dead. They're sleeping in Jesus. But we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Not on the earth. Not, in the, not Jesus pouring the Mount of Olives, touching foot on the ground, and destroying all the nations that are rising up against Israel. That's not us. That's not the coming we're waiting for. Okay? That's very important. You, you make those distinctions between the nation of Israel versus the church. Israel is not the church, and the church is not Israel. So we don't need to be applying anything that was promised to Israel to the church. So here we have something in 1 Thessalonians 4 of a coming of Christ that is not the second coming, but it is a coming for the church. And Jesus is in the air. He's in the air. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, in the air, not in Jerusalem, not in Armageddon, in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I would not be comfort if, comforted if I had to go through the tribulation. I would not be comforted. This, this right here would be a, a contradiction in the Bible if people are telling you you have to go through the tribulation. You've got a whole chapter of contradiction right there. Not just one chapter. You've got more spots. Titus 2.13. You've got Revelation chapters 1 to 4. So you say, but... So, so most of the arguments I get on that is, but rapture's, you know, the word rapture's not in the Bible. It's, it's, come on, that's the argument most people get, give, okay? Rapture's not in the Bible. Okay, so how about this? Millennial reign's not in the Bible. Okay? I, 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 give, I give another one. How about Trinity? Trinity's not in the Bible. Let, let, let me give you another one. Bible. Bible is not in the Bible. So what are we dealing? We're dealing with the teachings. The teachings of the rapture are in the Bible. The teachings of the millennial reign are in the Bible. The teachings of the Trinity are in the Bible. How about this one? This will probably run, run a lot of people the wrong way, but it's the truth. You can't be saved unless you know this. Jesus is God. The deity of Jesus Christ. He is fully man. So you want to go to all the verses that deal with Jesus being man, right? So you get all those verses and you attack the verses that we deal with the deity of Christ. And you say, well, we got this verse that says Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. We, why was he praying? Who was he praying to? And then you got these other verses that say, well, my father's greater than I am. Well, I'm not disputing those verses. I believe those verses. Those verses prove that Jesus Christ is fully man. I'm not disputing that. So, so... You're trying to fight me with verses that I believe in. The problem is you don't understand those verses if those are your contentions. We understand those verses. We don't deny the humanity of Christ. But he's not only human. He's fully God and, see, people always miss the and there, and fully man. So we got verses in the Bible that deal with it being fully man. We got verses in the Bible that deal with it being fully God. So what are you going to believe? Well, well I, I, I think you can only believe one thing. You know, he's either God or man. Which one is it? You got to take the pig, man. No, it's both. That's the problem. It's both. All right. So that's what we're dealing with with the rapture. You've you've got to take that by what the Bible says, not by what men out there are teaching. Okay, you say, but we're listening to you teach right now, ain't you a man? Yeah. Did did we not? Did I not tell you to go to First Thessalonians four? And you're supposed to check me out in the Bible like the Bereans did in Acts chapter 17, right? Search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. And you're supposed to check me out? Couldn't I be lying to you right now?
right now? Oh no, that preacher would lie. Preachers lie every day. Come on, really? Why are all those denominations in the world? Because people lie. People believe lies. You've got to check me out. You've got to check these guys out. You've got to check us out with a Bible. That's the only way you're going to know truth and error. So is the teaching of the rapture in the Bible? Absolutely yes. What do you do with 1 Thessalonians 4.16? You're meeting the Lord in the air. This is not second coming of Christ. People want to line up Matthew 24 with 1 Thessalonians 4. You can't do it because you've got a second coming of Christ where Jesus' feet touch the ground. That's, that's Revelation 19 and 20. The word of God's coming down on a white horse, and he's going to smite all the nations that are rising up against Israel and with, with, the, with the sword of his mouth. He's not doing that there. He's coming for all those that are in Christ. And we are going up in that rapture, and we're going to be with the Lord, 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be in the judgment seat of Christ. Not, not being judged to go to hell, but for what we've done in Christ. So, you want to cross-reference Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. You want another cross-reference? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, the come up hither of John. You say, well, that was John's rapture. John raptured up. John was raptured up and went to heaven. I beg to differ. I beg to differ. When John was raptured up, he's, and that's a picture of the church being raptured up to heaven. And what is John doing when he's in heaven? He's looking at the church there in heaven. And he's testifying in Revelation 4 all the way through the, the chapter of the 24 elders that are arrayed in white that have crowns on their head. Who has crowns? Who has crowns? Jewish elders don't wear crowns. Guess who has crowns? You guys ever heard of the five crowns that the church gets for faithfulness? You get a crown of righteousness, a crown of glory. These are elders, 24 elders representing the church. The church. And they're in heaven. They're not on earth. They're not going through three years, three and a half years of the tribulation. They're not going. Guys, we're the Jesus Christ would not put his bride through tribulation. To do what? Purify us? To purify us? No, it's not, it's not gonna happen. It's not, it, and it won't happen. Because Jesus Christ has made us pure. He made us spotless. He made us white as snow. It's by nothing good we've done. I don't need to suffer any tribulation. I don't need to be perfected. Guys, this is not a Catholic purgatory that we got to go through. Guys, absent from the body, present with the Lord, if you are saved today and you die before the rapture. But if you're still alive when that rapture comes, guess what? You're saved. You're going up in that body. Your body's going to be changed into a glorified body. And you're going to be with the Lord to meet him in the air. That's the Bible, guys. That's the Bible. And... People twist verses all the time, but I'm just going to answer that one, guys. I'm going to let one of you guys answer the, the other ones. Hopefully, that was a satisfactory answer, guys. Amen. I'll, I'll take the um, short turn. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down at them, or serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. Now, why did I go there? If you study the nation of Israel, they were bent on idolatry. Moses was um, commanded to make a serpent on a rod so the people that looked upon it could be healed. God commanded them to do that, so Moses did it. And a few years later, they were calling that serpent in the hush stand and worshiping that serpent. So God took it away. The Ark of the Covenant is missing because God knows that men would worship the Ark and not him. John chapter 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark under the sepulchre, and seeing the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. Now here's what they saw. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooping down, and looking in, and saw the linen clothes lying, yet went not in. Now the linen clothes are what Jesus was buried in. 
Let's continue. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went to the sepulcher and had seen the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying in the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Now, if you've seen the shadow here and a picture or a picture of it, it's one great big long cloth. According to the Bible, what Jesus buried it was in two parts. It was in two parts. So is the Bible right? Yes. Or is whoever has that shot of turn on display right? The Bible's right. It's two parts. But let's continue looking at this. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying in the linen clothes, but was wrapped together in a place by itself. There was an old Jewish custom, a very famous Jewish custom, when you're at a feast, all together with that a feast, and you got up from your place, and you're going to come back to your place in a little bit. If you had to go to the bathroom, you had to go to the You took your napkin, you folded it neatly, and put it in your place. And that told everybody that you're coming back to that place. What John saw, what Peter saw, and they went to that sepulcher. They saw the linen clothes laying there. They saw a napkin folded neatly. And that was a message from Jesus. That message was, I'm coming again. This is my place, but I'm coming back. So the Bible says that, that, that those grave clothes were in two pieces. The story out of turn is in one piece. So obviously, based on God's word, based on the Bible, the shroud of turn is a fake. It's not the grave clothes that Jesus was buried in. I'm sorry to bust your bubble, but the Bible's right and men are wrong. It's a fake. There are religions out here that have Hundreds and hundreds of pieces of the cross. They got enough pieces of the cross to rebuild this building. And the cross wasn't that big. It's fake. God does not want you to worship a sliver of the cross. God does not want you to worship the shroud of turn. God wants you to worship him. Because he's worthy of your praise. So if you look at God's word, only God's word, the shroud of turn is fake. Good evening. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, we had a little technical difficulty there. Not sure what he was answering with question. Uh, depends on your Bible, but Hebrews chapter 1 is after Paul's letters. Now, it's very interesting that this passage. Uh, this chapter is only 14 verses when I need to look at all of those. And this passage answers a number of important questions that come up today, dealing with different belief systems and different denominations and different, what we would call, cults and heresies. People have all these different ideas about, well, we'll, we'll just go through it. We'll answer this question and I'll answer a little bit more. Are we in the last days? The Bible says in Hebrews 1, verse 1, God, that is the God of the Bible, the only true God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So let's just stop there for a second. How did God speak in time past unto the fathers? By the prophets. We have the Old Testament, and it has lots of examples of that, of holy men of God that spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Sometimes they spoke in different forms. Sometimes they had visual displays. Sometimes God used things like hearts and brazen serpents and things like that. But notice how the writer makes a distinction. So in the past, God did this, but verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So God says, I used to speak... In Old Testament times, by these prophets, but now in the last days I've spoken through my son, who is in other places called the Word of God, and it says it on his vesture. It says that he's the Word of God. So, I don't know what your Bible says, but mine says A.D. 64, and we can argue about the date, but uh, the dates aren't given by God. The words of God are given by God. And at any rate, it's, uh, we're going to argue about 
Let's just say this is 64 AD like this says. So in 64 AD, the writer of Hebrews is saying these are the last days. And if he thought they were the last days in 64 AD, I would think that in 2016, they would definitely still be the last days. But since we're here, I just want to look at this third verse. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There are a lot of groups out there, some of whom will knock on your door and tell you about a, an earthly kingdom and so on and so forth. And they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. And were we to look down at verse 8, Under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Well, that's weird because their Bible changes that. They didn't like that. It didn't square up with their doctrine. I won't tell you what the name of the group is, but their headquarters are in Brooklyn, New York. Actually, they sold them, but they were around there somewhere. And also, I'd like to make a mention in verse 3. When he had by himself purged our sins. There's also a major religion out there. It's second to Islam in the number of adherents in the whole world. I won't tell you what it's called, but its headquarters are in Rome. And they say that everyone just about has to go to a place called purgatory. Well, that's funny. So, according to this doctrine, even though Jesus died for my sins, and even though I believe that, and even though his cross is supposedly paying for my sin, you know, maybe maybe uh, his, his cross wasn't strong enough, or maybe it sat out too long and got diluted, or I'm not really sure, but in their teaching, somehow or the other, that cross and that blood isn't strong enough. So I have to go to a place called purgatory so I can be purged from my sins. That's really weird because the Bible says that when he had by himself, with the help of Brother Jed, that's not what it says. When he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. What is the verb tense there? When he would start to purge and you would help him go into purgatory? No. When he had purged. It is an event that happened in the past and is still affecting the present and the future. Amen. So are we in the last days? Uh, we could obviously spend a lot of time on this. The simple and short answer is yes, and we have been for some time. Yeah, if you don't mind, let me uh, just briefly add something. Not that he didn't answer it, I think he did, but uh, regarding that shroud of turn thing, it is two, two pieces, as the Bible does say, there's two uh, garments. John chapter 19 and verse number 39, the Bible says this, and there came also Nic Nicodemus, which was at which at the first came to Jesus by night, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it up in the linen cloth, cloth with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Okay, you see that right there? Then in the other, uh, let's see here, in John chapter 20, uh, just a few verses back, it says, verse uh, 5, it says, And he stooping down, speaking of uh, Peter, and looking in, he saw the linen cloth lying, yet went he not in, then came in Simon Peter, following him. Oh, that was John looking down, sorry. And he went into the sepulcher and see him the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but wrapped together in a place by itself. So you see that one folded up garment, and then you see he was wound up. Okay? The Shroud of Turin, if you've ever observed it, it's a one long piece of cloth. And his image is, is spread straight out on the cloth, as if the cloth was draped over him like you would a table. You would put a tablecloth on there. And the image is on that, okay? What you see here is he was wound. So that says he was wrapped like a mummy. So if you wound that up, you would have to wind that up to get the image parts to line up if that were the case, which it isn't, because the, dot, the garment, that, the cloth that they have, it's like a tablecloth. It's a straight piece of cloth, and it's fakery. And all I would say is in, in Colossians 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit in the tradition of men after the rudiments of world and not of the world and not after Christ. There's lots of traditions in the Catholic Church. I was raised a Roman Catholic, you're not a good one. I didn't go to a Catholic Church, but they have many traditions. They they supposedly have the finger of Peter at Peter's Basilica. They have his finger. What does that matter if you have his finger? Do you have Christ Jesus? Yeah. As your Savior. See, yeah, that's yeah, the important yeah. thing. 
If you, you, you take things, they have, they have bones of, of certain uh, um, saints that they have, and they bury them, and then they build a church. And what you have there is an easy way. People are very much into tradition. We all have little traditions and things that we do, okay? And, and those things may not be bad in and of themselves, but when you have a tradition that is extra biblical and you say, I have the, Peter, the finger of Peter, and we're going to build a basilica here, how do you get money to build the basilica? You go to the faithful who follow after the traditions of men and after the rudiments of the world, but not after Christ. Yes. And you are easily you, you, you easily fund the, the building of the building. Yes. And that's exactly what you have. And that's the rudiments of the world. Right. That's the way the world does things. It's a fundraiser, and that's how you do it. If you had the Shroud of Turin, it wouldn't matter. If you didn't have Jesus Christ, right. you would die in your sins, right. and you would go to a devil's hell that was not prepared for yeah. you. And you would then spend eternity in the lake of fire. Okay, so yeah. the main thing you need to understand is this. Do not get caught up in tradition. Believe the word of God. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Trust him as your Savior and be born again. Yeah. And you won't have to worry about all those other things. The false will fall away and the Holy Spirit will guide you and direct you in all truth if you believe him. But you got to believe this. Amen. Not the traditions of men. We all have some tradition. That doesn't matter. In the scheme of things, if you're not born again, that's the problem. So just, that's another point. Just think about it. Excuse me. We're going to answer these questions first here. It says, um, number three, what is the unpardonable sin and can we commit it today? Well, we've got two possibilities in Scripture. So go ahead and get Matthew chapter 12 and Mark chapter 3. Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapter 3. We'll take this one first. First, looking at the book of Matthew, verse number 24, but when the Pharisees heard it, that's his healing, and they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself is shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall it, uh, how then, uh, how shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy of the holy uh, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Now, the cross reference to that is found in Mark chapter three. The Bible says in uh, Mark chapter three. Again, verse 26, and if Satan rise up against Satan, he is a, against himself, he is divided, he cannot stand, but have an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily, I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies, wherewith soever, yeah, wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness but is in danger of eternal damnation, colon, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. So the first scriptural possibility is if somebody saw the Lord Jesus Christ casting out a devil and said, this is the work of the devil. That's the first scriptural possibility. Now the other thing it says, but is in danger of eternal <coughs> damnation. So when you run scripture with scripture, get John chapter 16. John chapter 16. The Lord Jesus Christ speaking here. And I, I tell you guys, you know, get with us, follow along in the scripture because you have questions because you're not looking at the scripture. You don't understand what's going on with God, with the Word of God, salvation, all these things, because you're not in the Scripture. And again, as Brother Ed said, I could lie to you. 
He could lie to you. Any of us could lie to you. You guys lie. We think the two men lie to each other. That's what they do. So the only person you can trust is God. So I would suggest just pick up the Bible, open it up. We can answer your questions. But in John chapter 16, he says, verse number 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, capital C, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, that's the Spirit of God, the Comforter, when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. The Holy Spirit of God was sent by the Lord Jesus Christ into the believer, a saved, born-again, gospel-believing Christian, so that they could go and tell others that gospel, and the sin that you are condemned for is not believing on Jesus. So if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, what are you doing? You are not believing what the Holy Ghost is witnessing to you. When I tell you that you are a sinner condemned by God because of your sin, and if you do not repent and call upon Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, and you refuse to believe that, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit of God. That's his job. His job through me is to tell you and everybody else in the world that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead so that you and I can have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. You don't believe that, you will go to hell because the only sin that is left, not paid for by the cross, is your unbelief. That's John chapter 16. Um, it says there, of righteousness... Because I go to my Father, you see me no more. Uh, when it comes to righteousness, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, again, the work of the Holy Ghost, verse 20, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, that's God the Father, hath made him, that's God the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That Holy Spirit of God is to reprove you of sin, of righteousness, because you and I, were not righteous. I have no righteousness. These men have no righteousness. You have no righteousness. And the only way for you to get acceptable righteousness in the eyes of God is when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and God accounts, imputes that righteousness to you. And the last one there, it says, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Jesus Christ, God manifested in a body of flesh, tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. And you are going to stand before God in judgment, not just for the things that you've done, but the things that you've said. Jesus Christ said, ye shall give an account of every idle word ye ever spoke. And right here, Romans 2, your secrets, the secrets of men. God is going to judge in the last day by Jesus Christ. So that's the work of the Holy Spirit to reprove you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And when you refuse that reproof, when you refuse to repent and call upon Jesus Christ, you will never be forgiven because you will die unsaved and end up in hell. I, hope, I don't want that to happen to any one of you. Any one of you, all of you can easily be saved. It's a simple matter of faith. The Bible says in Romans 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That, God made it that simple, that simple for every one of you to receive forgiveness of sin. Number four. As you know, it's 
we're using God's word to answer these questions. We're not using our opinions. I've seen a couple of guys shaking their head. You're not, you're not disagreeing with us. You're disagreeing with God. We're using God's word. So if you have a problem with the answer, I hope you don't. Your problem is with God. We're going to use God's word as our final authority. Next one. If God condemns sinners for all eternity, doesn't that make God a sadist by definition? And his parenthesis in the bottom, I'm aware that we condemn ourselves. He answered the question for himself. <laughs> Deuteronomy, book of Deuteronomy, fifth book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The word sadist is not in the Bible, so I don't know where you're getting that at, but Deuteronomy chapter 32, God speaking to everybody, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth. The word of my mouth, my doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and the sh as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Verse number four, he is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. God is without iniquity. He's a God of truth. He's a God of righteousness. He's a, he is a just God. And, and here's, here's how this works. You're, you're talking about being condemned for all eternity. You're not. You have the opportunity right now to be saved. And you okay. Well, here's, here's, I guess, what will help you get this. Jesus Christ, of the scriptures, the Bible says, in, in the book of Isaiah, they ripped out his, uh, he hid not his face from them that plucked out the hairs. They ripped out his beard by the roots. Isaiah 52 also says that his visage, that's his face, was marred more than any man. No human being's feet, face has ever been so dismantled than the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 22 says that all his bones were out of joint. He's beaten by Roman soldiers. Now he's God manifest in the flesh. Hebrews says that he's got a body prepared for this. So he is standing there as God manifested in a body of flesh, having taken this beating. The Bible says that the plowman made long their furrows. He hid not his back from, uh, from shame and spitting. He, um, or his face from shame and spitting, he gave his back to the smiters. The Roman soldiers beat him with their fists, beat him with rods, beat him with whips, ripped out his beard by the roots, nailed his hands to a cross, nailed his feet to a cross, put a crown of thorns on his head, and then Jesus Christ suffers the wrath of God that you and I deserve upon the cross. And all you have to do is call upon him for the salvation of your soul. Get, get one more place. Get Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And again, I, I would urge you, follow along with us. This is, this is tremendous. You want to know why people are condemned. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says, verse number 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Okay? If someone had done a sin or broken the law under Moses' law, and they had two or three witnesses to the fact, stone them to death. Man, first Sabbath day there after the Lord gives the law, he's picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. They bring him before God. And they say, God, what do we do with this guy? He was picking up sticks. God said, stone him with stones that he died. You say, man, that's mean. That's harsh. He heard the words of God. God said not to violate the Sabbath. He had six other days to be picking up sticks. 
to gather firewood. And we had two or three witnesses. God says, all right, stone him with stones that he died. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God? Okay? You are all sinners. We are all sinners. Jesus Christ suffered all of those things for us. All you have to do is call upon him for the salvation of your soul, and you think you're going to stand before God and say, you wasted your time, man. That was, that was dumb. That was a folly. That's why there's hell. You reject Jesus Christ who suffered all of that for you. When you're the one who's done wrong, he's never done anything Amen. wrong. Amen. And you reject that. What do you want God to do with you? That, that, and it's so simple. All you have to do is repent and call upon Jesus Christ to be saved. And that's it. All your sins are taken away. You're washed clean in the blood. You've got eternal everlasting life. Forgiveness of sin. Home in heaven. All of those things. Praise God. And God is willing to do that with a simple act of faith. That's it. That's all he asks. So that, that's why people are condemned because... They reject Jesus Christ. You can tell a lot by somebody when they're asking questions about things like this by the vocabulary they use. If we were to watch the news right now, which we wouldn't, because that would be bad news, someone on the news would say somebody who wants an abortion is pro-choice. And as soon as I hear that, I know that person hates this book by the words they use. Now, if they say they're pro-life, I say, oh, they want babies to live. But pro-choice, oh, we know the woman has this right. So, of course women should have rights, but that child is a person too, and it should, that's another, another question. But I, I can tell by this this question, um, this, this person is accusing God of being sadistic. I can already tell by the emotionally hypercharged words that you have an ax to grind with the Almighty. And it's very amazing when we talk to sinners, as everyone is a sinner, uh, but people who don't want to repent, that when the question is put on them, hey, you need to get right and trust God, they, they not only drop that question, they want to point their machine gun up to God and start charging him with theirs, which is very strange. Can you imagine being in a courtroom and telling the judge that he was an error? <laughs> who do you think you are? And that's exactly what you're doing to God. But I want to read you a verse out of the Bible so you don't think this is just something I made up. Oh, and by the way, if you reject God, you reject heaven, you reject hell and all that, uh, you have no absolute authority by which to call anything good or evil. Whatever you think is good or evil is something you made up out of your head. It's completely arbitrary and has no absolute big uh, backing. Excuse me, arbitrary. If you look in your, look in your Bible at Ezekiel chapter 18, God doesn't do things for just no rhyme or reason. He doesn't just wake up one day and say, oh, I feel like doing this. Right. God does things by his word. Surely the Lord will do nothing but revealing things to his prophets and Amos. So God does things by his word. God is unchanging. You and I are very changing. Take a quick side trip. I spent a lot of time in Mississippi. I was raised and grew up in Florida. People in Florida have, you know, a certain kind of accent. But when I lived in Mississippi and I came back here, people would make fun of me and said I sounded like I was Southern. I didn't have that accent before I moved to Mississippi, but I spent so much time talking to people from Mississippi that that accent started to get in me. And I accidentally talked like that a little bit. I had that tiny bit of a twang, not much. I don't think I have any more about my... But you know what? The more time I spent around those people, that rubbed off on me. You know what? We change we're like that so much. The people you hang around change you. Anyways, God does not change. Malachi, I, the Lord, do not change. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 25, Yet you say the way of the Lord is not equal. First of all, who do you think you are uh, telling God whether he's equal or not? Well, I just believe in equality. Well, let's see what God said. The way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, a house of Israel. Is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? You're charging God with being sadistic. Have you ever been sadistic? Uh, yeah, you have. Have you ever wanted to see someone get hurt and were happy when they got hurt? Yes, you have. 
Did you ever have malice in your heart? Like, I hate that person. I hope that something happens to him. Yes, you have. Who are you charging God with an error? Maybe you should get a mirror and look at it. Is not my way equal or not your way is unequal? Now look, God should just say, get this foolish man out of my courtroom. I want nothing to do with him. He's a joke. God, God has every right to say that. But look what he says in the passage. He cuts you some slack. When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and dieth in them for his iniquity that he hath done, shall he die. Again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed and does, I'm sorry, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Because he considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he shall commit. It. He shall surely live, he shall not die, yet save the house of Israel. So God tells these people, You're the ones that aren't equal. Your ways are the ones that aren't right. And God cuts them some slack. And look what's the first thing they say. The way of the Lord is not equal. He just told them that they were wrong. He told them that they were totally out of line. But I'm still going to cut you some slack. I promise you if you go in the courthouse and start acting up. And start acting like a total hooligan. That judge is going to put you right out there. He's not going to give you a second chance. But God Almighty would give you a second chance. And say hey you need to come to me. But what does the sinner do? The same thing as the people in this book. The way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal, are not your ways unequal? You don't treat everybody equally and good and just and right. You have favorites that you play. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from, all, from you all your transgressions, whereby you transgress, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. Get that by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, by the way. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Why does God ask that in the question? Because there's no good answer for it. Why will you die? Why will you willingly bring that upon yourself? That um, leads into our last question. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Again, I don't know who this person was that wrote this question. I don't need to know. God knows your heart. I'm not God. I don't know your hearts. But God knows your heart. And whoever wrote this question, your ways are very unequal according to God. And he's equal. And for you to charge him with an error, you have a lot of nerve. You have a whole lot of nerve to shake your fist at the Almighty who gave, who gave you life and gave you breath and lets you stay alive today. And if that wasn't enough, you live in the best country in the history of the universe. And you speak the most important language in the whole world, as far as the business world goes. And you have so many blessings that you live in America, and you have the nerve to charge God with an error. That's really amazing. But besides that, God is going to still cut you some slack today. While it's still, what, 742? You have the chance to say, you know what, I'm really out of line, and God's cutting me some slack. I better repent and come to the table on God's terms, not on your terms. You say, oh, I don't like God's terms. It doesn't matter. Those are the only terms there are. Yeah. I'll give one ex ex um, example. I'll sit down. When I was little, or growing up, or what have you, you know, you would say something, you would do something, and you would tell your mom, your dad, well, I don't like that. And they'd say, well, when you get your own house and pay your own bills, you can do things your way. You don't like the, the temperature? Great. You get you a little apartment, and you pay the high electricity bills. And I didn't understand that when I was 5 and 15. When I started living by myself, I understood that perfectly. It didn't make sense then, and no matter how many times I said it makes sense. But when I got my, you know, when I moved out, I could set the air what I wanted to. I could listen to the radio. I could be a slob, or I could be clean. I could do whatever I wanted to. And then the sinner says, well, I don't like God. I don't like his rules. But I got, I got to the point. God made this whole universe. He made the rules. He set them up. He didn't text me and ask for advice. He did it the way he wanted to. If you don't like God's rules, go out and make your own universe, and you can make up whatever rules you want. And you can chill there, and you can text us and tell us how great it is. Until then, you are in God's universe, and it ain't changing, you southern just like it. It's not changing. God's not going to change his rules because Americans don't like them. So make your own universe, or come to the table and get on God's terms. There's no other option. Amen. Amen. We're out of time. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to you. We didn't get to your question. I'm sorry. Um, we, we tried to be as concise as possible. This isn't a game show. It's a Bible study. We wanted to be concise.
If you have, we'll stay after as long as you want. We'll answer any questions you have. Um, I want to end up with a little bit of Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Like I said at the beginning, we can answer every question you have, and it's not going to save your soul. You have to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've got to believe the gospel. The word gospel is used quite a bit. There are many, many religions that use the word gospel, but don't know what the word gospel means. So I'm going to tell you what God says about the gospel is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. You're saved by, by believing the gospel. But what is the gospel? If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, no, she have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ died, according to the scriptures. What that means is he fulfilled every single prophecy concerning his death. According to the scriptures, he died. And then he was buried. And he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Again, he fulfilled every single prophecy. And he was seen in Cephas in the twelve. And after that, he was seen about five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained in the distant present, but some were fallen asleep, some were dead. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose from the third day. He defeated death. He defeated the grave. He defeated hell. He has the king, the keys of hell and death in his hand. He wants to give you that salvation free of charge. No charge, no strings. You don't have to do anything but believe in him. Like I said, I saw some men shaking their head. You know, we live in a free country. You have, you have the right to make a choice. And God is a gentleman. God's going to give you that same right to make a choice. But God's also given you all the information you need to know the consequences of that choice. You choose Jesus Christ, you get life eternal. You reject Jesus Christ. You reject the Holy Spirit's leading you to Him. You get life everlasting in hell. Forever. Forever. The first man born on this planet killed his brother. He died in our hell about 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years he's been burning in torments. That's a long time. And he has to be there for eternity. The choice is yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the men that took the time to study, that took the time to come out of here to answer questions. I pray, Lord, and it's touched some hearts, Lord, that people would want to get saved. We thank you, Lord. We sure do love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.